and we'll go ahead and get started. Hey Tracy, thank you. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me okay. All right guys, good morning. Uh, my name is Suzy Maniam. Uh, I run a company called Elephant Scale. Uh, we focus on big data. Uh, we do a fair bit of consulting, uh, a lot of training around it. And uh, while you're waiting, um, looking at the slide, you can see at the bottom, uh, we are doing this webinar with 4JS. Uh, thanks so much for having me. And you can also listen to past webinars. Uh, looking at the link below. So elephantscale.com slash webinars. You can go look at recordings there as well. Cool. Let's get started. So a uh, quick background. Um, again, I'm, I'm into big data. So that means Hadoop, um, Spark, NoSQL. Uh, we wrote a couple of books. First book is called Hadoop Illuminated. Uh, it's Did actually you, I don't want to interrupt, book, but we're not, we're not seeing your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Now you should. There we go. That's perfect. <laughs> How's now? Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah that would have made a difference. Yes. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tracy. So um, uh, we work on big data. We wrote a couple of books. Uh, first one is Hadoop Illuminated. Uh, it's an open source book. You can actually do a search for it and download it. And also one for HBase. HBase is a, um, it's a NoSQL database. And in a bunch of links here, email. And, and feel free to shoot me an email after the um, webinar. Um, ping me on LinkedIn. I'm very open. All right, NoSQL, right? Um, I sort of put this cartoon up uh, because NoSQL is all the rage these days. So people said, oh, hey, somebody's like, hey, do you know NoSQL? No. So, you know, maybe we should put an expert as NoSQL, right? Uh, NoSQL is pretty popular. At the same time, the landscape is pretty complicated. So we just want to sort of um, get you guys, walk you guys through the landscape to see what's available, how do you evaluate a NoSQL system, and all, towards the end, if we have some time, I will show you a quick demo of Cassandra uh, doing some data modeling. All right, so let's get started. So imagine you're doing a your startup. Let's say you're building your Facebook, right? So what you would do is sort of you know you sort of build your application. Um, uh, and then you know, put a, put a database, uh, just a regular, maybe like a something like MySQL or you know one of the open source ones. Throw them on a you know on a web server and then say and launch it. So let's see, we launch this and the service gets popular. How are we going to scale from from this this architecture? Right? That's a question. So as you can see, you can say, hey, you know what? Our uh, most of the bottleneck is going to be the let's say isolate the database, so you will say, you know what, we're going to move the database out to a different machine, right, you can sort of see here, and then we are going to stack a bunch of web servers uh, to handle the load. So you can stack the web servers as many as you want uh, most of the time, right, put them behind the load balancer right here, but they are still going to the same database. So the, um, the, the model here is the web stack is easy to scale because sort of the HTTP is stateless, right? So your request can go to here for the first time, and the next time you can go to another web server, so that scales fine. However, as you can see, they are still getting the same database. So this maybe buys you a few more months, uh, and then we are still, you know, the service is still growing, it's getting very, very popular. How do we scale from here? So the next step, right? At this point, we realize our bottleneck is going to be a database. So at this point, you can have to go and say, yeah, how do we scale the database? Um, and usually that involves some sort of a sharding. So we will say a single database is a bottleneck. We haven't divided the database up into you know, a bunch of different ones. Let's say one, two, three. I have three databases. And now, depending on the request comes in, the request goes to a different database. Now, this is good, right? But what happens is you can ask anybody who has done this at scale, uh, and this is called sharding, by the way, right? It's called sharding, right? Sharding a database. And, and you can ask anybody who has done sharding at scale. It's kind of easy to get started, but it, it takes a lot of babysitting to get it right and maintain it and run it. All right. So basically, the model of the story is they, with the, using a relational RDBMS, RDBMS, they're kind of hard to scale. Or expensive, right? Either one. So you know, I mean, yeah, you know, you can go and buy one of those really expensive ones, but uh, typical open source ones are hard to scale. All right. 
So what do we do? Right? So what's wrong with RDBMS? Really not, not a whole lot, right? I mean, they've been great so far. Uh, you know, we all know uh, RDBMS, we grew up using them. Um, you know, SQL is great. Um, you know, we all know SQL. And there are so many tools and libraries that RDBMS support. And also, they are very nice enough to give us transactions. You can do schemas. However, the downside is most of them are um, architected for a single machine architecture. Because, you know, databases have like a, you know, a 30 year history. And when they were written, it's pretty much we are single machines. And the way you can scale the database is by going vertically. Right? So you can have to buy bigger and bigger machines uh, with more memory, more CPU to scale. And after a while, right, it's, you, know, you sort of hit the limit. I mean, you know, no matter how much money you're willing to spend, there's only uh, so, so, so much um, further you can go. And even charting, as we saw so earlier, it's not really easy to do at scale. Uh, uh, we did a startup, and um, yeah, we are charting. And after a, about a year into this whole charting, uh, we did an audit of our software. And we found about 20 30% of the code is just dedicated for managing the sharding. Right? So that's code we kind of have to write outside of our business logic just to sort of manage the, uh, the, the whole database and the sharding. Right? So yeah, so basically, as, as a developer, you are kind of doing, doing this on your own. So there's going to be an easier way, right? What is an easier way? And also, these days, the applications we are developing, uh, it's very common to have millions of users. Uh, in the startup I mentioned, you know, when we got our 1,000 users, that was like a big celebration, right? We were like, oh, we got 1,000 users. But now you do an application, and easily you can get millions of users if it goes viral. And also, your, your web applications are now dealing with what we call big data, meaning you have large amounts of data coming in, so your database has to deal with that. So let's take a look at this one. This is a kind of nice chart that shows you how the data is growing, right? So right here at the bottom, sort of the structured data, right? This is like your database, key, you know, something that fits in your database schema. However, most of the growth, as you can see, kind of happens right here. A lot of semi-structured or unstructured data. So you can think about like, you know, click streams, logs, and you know, your tweets, so on and so forth. So we need a database that can handle the unstructured data. Uh, so, yeah, example, you know, uh, this morning I just used my uh, Google Apps uh, to Google Maps to do a navigation. So, as you can imagine, millions of users use it. And as you're using the map application, it's actually sending data back to Google. It could be uh, your location, your speed, uh, anything else. So, that's how they sort of use, use that to figure out how's your traffic, um, how fast are you moving. So, you can imagine every day they have to store billions of data points. Um, just you know, from the users using the map application. So what I really want, right, as a web developer, is sort of this magical database. Oops. So imagine I can just read and write to the database, and the database will actually do it'll do sharding for me. It'll automatically divide the data up. It'll do load balancing for me. Always available. I mean, never crashes, right? And I can scale easily. Meaning I can start small. And then I can keep expanding without any effort. So that's why you know it's kind of a unicorn, right? Because it's it's a magical data store. Surprisingly, you can actually have this um, by using a lot of the open source NoSQL databases, and that's what we are going to look at. And this is when sort of NoSQL comes in, right? So NoSQL is we you know we sort of uh, at least my interpretation is like we say not only SQL. A lot of the NoSQLs are built for with one goal in mind: scale, scale, scale. Right? Because that was a pain point with RDBMS. With RDBMS, you know, we were happy with the tools, we were happy with the schema, and everything is fine. Just, just wasn't scaling well. And so, one of the primary goals of NoSQL is scale. And it's about the same time sort of Hadoop was getting prominent. So they took a lesson from Hadoop, and then they said, "Hey, we don't want to do a single machine cluster uh, database. We want to do a database that runs on multiple machines, a cluster of machines. And even those machines, we want them to be commodity." Right? We don't want to go and buy special hardware, really expensive hardware. This should be just some simple Linux server machines we should run. And scalability, meaning we need to scale horizontally. We don't want to do the upgrade game anymore. Right? We don't want to buy a machine and then upgrade in a year or upgrade in a few months. If we want more capacity, it should be simple. We should be adding simply just expand the cluster with no downtime. 
right? So we can do like a live update and then cluster will expand automatically. Fail tolerant. What do we mean by that is imagine I'm running on a cluster. Uh, let's say I'm running on a 10 node cluster. I lost a, I, one node crashed, one machine crashed. My database should stay up. Just because one node crashed, it shouldn't go down. Right? So it's called failure tolerant. And more importantly, we also want a flexible data model. Remember the, the diagram we saw, we are now getting more and more data that's kind of semi structure So we don't want something that enforces schema rigidly. We want something that gives us flexible schema. Now, of course, we want to handle sort of the big data, I meaning, you know, when I say the big data, like, you know, terabytes, hundreds of terabytes of data. We also want to read and write data without very fast, without having to wait for logs or, you know, blocks or something. So if you can, if you can have all this, you can, but it kind of comes with a little, you know, comes with a little gotcha, right? So, so we have to give up some of the niceties we are getting used to. For example, secondary indexes are usually um, kind of, you know, um, uh, either not existent or, uh, or, or not supported or, you know, just a kind of a very basic functionality. Definitely no joins. So imagine if you had to go and you know, rewrite the web application without any joins. And, you know, very little transaction support. Uh, so you, we gain something, scale and flexibility, but we are sort of giving up something, that, you know, we, we sort of took for, taking for granted with the databases. All right. So a quick recap of our, you know, ACID principle, right? This is our, you know, DB, if you think about your DB 101 class, um, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability, right? Atomicity is basically, you know, all or nothing. Um, meaning, you know, either you do the whole transaction or you don't. Consistency is, um, you know, your database is always in a consistent state. Isolation is you can run multiple transactions, but, you know, they, they, don't, they don't step on each other's toes, right? They're going kind to of running on their own. And durability means once you save data, your data is safe. So if you're building like a mission critical system, yeah, you definitely need asset. Another thing about trans supporting transactions in distributed systems is it's really kind of hard, hard to do. Because imagine now, you know, you have, you don't have just a single machine anymore. You have multiple nodes, all right? You have a cluster of machines that you need to coordinate. So how do you do a transaction at a distributed scale? What if in the middle of a transaction, one of your nodes that crashed? So there are a lot of these things that I've taken care of. And usually for NoSQL, they say, hey, you know what? We don't support transaction because it's just, just too hard to do it at a distributed scale. So you'd say, hey, how can I, what can I do without transactions? Right. Um, there are applications we can build um, that, that doesn't need a transaction. We'll look at them in a, in, a, in a second. So let's go to C, right, consistency. So I'm going to look at consistency in sort of a different way, right? Uh, so basically, imagine I'm, you know, I, I'm, somebody's updating X from, say, 10 to 20. Right. And now I'm reading X. We would expect to get the latest value, which is 20, right? Uh, that may not be the case all the time. I'll explain um, uh, why. Because it depends on the consistency level, whether we have a strong or eventual, you make a 20 or you make a 10. Interesting, huh? Okay, let's look at this. So let's say you go to a bank, you go to the teller, get some money out, and then, then come outside and uh, go to the ATM and check your balance. Your balance will reflect the, 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 the latest transaction. Right? If you took some money out, it will actually reflect how uh, you took some money out. You could have your friend, you know, from another state, check, the, check an ATM, the balance will be the same. So what we say here is it's strongly consistent, meaning every reader is getting the same value. So imagine the ATM is a reader, is checking your account balance, they're all getting the same value. Strong consistency, right? Another one, let's say you, you know, go, go to your coffee shop. You, uh, you place an order, but you don't get the drink right away, right? So you, you sort of place the order here, and then you sort of go join another queue uh, to collect your drink. Eventually, when you walk out of the coffee shop, your transaction is complete, right? So that, that's, this is called eventual consistency. Let's say while you're waiting in the queue, let's say you go the you know, uh, a wrong order. You don't have to. You don't have to go back to the beginning and void your transaction and you know do the whole thing again, right? Because you know usually the baristas here serving your drink, they will fix your drink. They will say sorry about this. You know we'll you know we'll do the right order. So self-correcting. So eventually, once you walk out of the coffee shop, after all is done, your transaction is complete. 
So two, two, two transactions, right? This is called eventual. So eventual basically means is readers uh, will eventually catch up. For example, you know, let's say X was updated from 10 to 20. Right? Some readers make it 20, some make it 10. Depending on the depending on the time of query and some other conditions, and we'll say, wait a second, what kind of application I can build with a you know where a database can't even give me the latest data? Uh, you'll be surprised what we can build. So imagine this. Let's say I'm watching a um, um, you know a, a YouTube video. Right? This is so so time this is a timeline, and at this point somebody posted a comment right here, new comment. Let's say the very next second somebody sort of reloading the page. He may not see the latest comment, right? Maybe if, the, if you're going to look at the page, maybe like a few seconds later, at that point the comment shows up. So eventually everything is consistent. And the comment eventually propagates through the system and it shows up. And we use systems like this on a daily basis without even realizing we are, you know, we are using eventually consistent systems, right? Because um, think about you know tweets or videos. So like you don't need to look at the late, you, know, you don't need to have the latest. Uh, data. Even if we get some old data, that's perfectly okay. So eventual consistency, we use it in, in our life all the time without even realizing it. And finally, durability, right? Um, uh, even with NoSQL, durability is, is great. They take um, great care to make sure your data is not lost, right? This is sort of the last part of the asset, so we want to make sure our data is safe. All right, so we just went through the uh, whole asset thing, right? Um, so when do we really, we really don't need it? If you are building some sort of financial uh, system, yes, you need asset, right? Absolutely. But for example, let's say you are uh, doing like a map application that's you know checking in, um, you know, um, the application is sending data. There's no transaction, right? Let's say you know I'm sort of you know this is my travel path. I'm sort of you know you know giving you these little breadcrumbs, right? All you have to do is just store them very quickly. Let's say you sort of missed storing these two. Some something happened. You sort of forgot to you know you know something. You know, crashed or you didn't you know, miss these storing these points, no big deal, right? Because you can sort of continue with the breadcrumbs and still sort of you know, construct the path. So something like this, and again, you know, these apps we use all the time, you don't need transactions. What we need is we need very, very fast writes and very, very fast reads. So if we can give some asset properties, we can the result is we can gain some massive scale. That's the idea. Right? That's that's kind of the principle we can no SQL. Anything, anything we wanted was highly available, right? I want my database to be always available, no downtime at all. Right? My, my clusters, you know, nodes go up and down. My database as a whole should stay up. That's a nice idea. However, even if you know never, there's a little catch. That catch is called CAP theorem. So CAP theorem stands for C for consistency, which we just saw, right? Availability, you know, always available. And the final one is called partition tolerance. So partition tolerance is something new, especially when you're building um, cluster systems, right? So take a look at this. Imagine I were, you know, a, a, my cluster is six nodes, right? All these guys. But something happened, some sort of network event happened, some, you know, some network switch got damaged or some, you know, router um, went bad or something, whatever. My network link got disrupted. So now I have two different clusters, cluster A with three nodes here and cluster B with three nodes over here. And they are both connected. My clients actually are connected to you know, on both ends. Now, in this scenario, can my system function? Right? This is what partitioning goes. Meaning partition tolerance. Can my system tolerate partitioning, network partitioning? And you can imagine, so because now this cluster things, they are the only one alive, right? Because they cannot communicate with the other group. And the other group thinks these, you know, they are the only one alive because they cannot reach these guys. So the, this is what we call split brain, because you know they cannot we have two brains thinking. Can your system survive this? What CAP theorem says is the systems we are building now, in any of these, consistency, availability, and partitioning, you can have two out of three at a, at a time. Right? You, you can't have all three. You can only have two out of three. So, so the way to imagine this is like, look, look at a little Venn diagram. So if you say, you know, like uh, we draw this, consistency, availability, and partitioning, there's nothing here in the middle that can do all three. At least not yet. The systems we are building, they can support all three at the same time. You can have, you can have something here, you can have something here, but nothing that satisfies all three. Make sense? 
Another way to look at KPLM is sort of like this. Imagine this, right? So uh, here's my, my little triangle. I have consistency, availability, and partitioning, right? And what we see is there's nothing in the middle, of course, right? Nothing satisfies all three. So these days, when you're building a cluster-wide system, partitioning is pretty much a given. You have to support partitioning, meaning you know nodes going down, network connections being interrupted, right? So you have to support this. What Cap Theorem says is, once you choose partitioning, you can only support this way, consistency or availability. You have to choose. You cannot have both. So, for example, uh, Google Bigtable, sort of the, you know, one of the very first NoSQL storage, they chose to support, um, they chose to be consistent. So, Google Bigtable is where you know your Gmails and Google Docs and everything is stored, right? Um, and you know, it, it, it's also really great. Uh, Real-time lookups. They just be consistent. MongoDB, HPACE. HPACE is a, you know, another clone of um, our Google Bigtable. It's an open source implementation of Bigtable, and they also chose to support partitioning and consistency. What it means is they may not be highly available. That's the trade off. Right? There are periods the system may not be available. And I'm sure you've seen that when you go to your Gmail, um, uh, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen once in a while. You will say, say like a little yellow warning window saying unable to connect to Gmail. They will keep retrying, right? And after a few seconds, they will connect back. Uh, I've seen this a couple of times. I'm sure you guys have too. All right, let's go, let's go to the next scam. Let's say I'm supporting partitioning, but I want to be highly available, meaning my system is always available. So here's where you know things like Cassandra, uh, Dynamo, Amazon Dynamo DB come in. Right? So here's another group. So by cap theorem, what what we mean is, when you choose partitioning, you have to either be in this camp supporting consistency or in this camp supporting availability. And this influences your choice. And depending on the application you're building, uh, you need to choose you know, one or the other. Right? So for example, for email, Google, Google chose Bigtable to be highly consistent. Right? Because for email, all the readers should see the latest value. That's very important. Cassandra focused on being highly available so they sacrifice a little bit of a consistency uh, in doing that. So, cap, cap, uh, sort of cap theorem and the effect, I, I, I hope it's clear. Very quickly, let's look at, when you say NoSQL, uh, there's a kind of a, a bunch of, we sort of bunch of a lot of these NoSQLs into one big umbrella. Let's look at these um, uh, different NoSQLs um, types. The first one is key value store, right? So this is basically, at the, at the end of the day, a simple hash table. I put a key and a value, right, pair in, that's it, and I can look at look, look, uh, the value again. Basically, no indexes, right, just, just access using keys. And it's just something like Redis and Memcache, the other examples of those. The next step up is basically document stores, right? I mean, one of the uh, really good ones like Mongo. Mongo is pretty popular to storing documents. So in a database, right, we know you will know, store data as columns, right? For example, I would say column is a name. This is, you know, uh, zip code, right? We'll store data. In Mongo, what they did is, there's no rows and columns, but it's a document, right? Here's a document you sort of see, a person's details, name and zip code and address. So Mongo is pretty popular. Usually they do second indexes uh, and some sort of a MapReduce operations for, um, you know, uh, high throughput. Scalability is sort of small to medium. And the next group is called graph databases. So graph is like your LinkedIn, right? So let's say this is you, you know, you're connected to somebody and then they're connected to somebody, right? Uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, we use them all, all the time. Uh, so Neo uh, and Titan are in a couple of graph databases. They're specifically built to store and handle graphs. And finally, we're going to what we call wide column database. This is where sort of Cassandra, HPS, Acumen, all these guys come in. What I mean is like a single row, right? Imagine like a database row can have millions of columns right here. Why do we need this? Um, we'll sort of see a little bit later because these databases are built for huge scale, so a single row can actually support millions of columns. Okay. So here's a summary, right? If you look at NoSQL, we have key value, document, graph, and white column. And this is where sort of the Cassandra and Acumen these guys come in. So another thing you will hear is this something called columnar store. Right? So what, what exactly 
calculates that. So before we look at columnar store, let's sort of look at row based store. So this is how database, uh, you know, sort of legacy database store data. What they do is they store entire row together on a disk. Right? So let's say this is my row. I have three columns, column one, two, three. They are stored on disk together. Then the next row will start. Right? So on and so forth. And, and then next row, so on and so forth. And this is why, remember when you, when you declare, say, something like var char, right? You have to sort of give it like a, you know, a length. Because the reason is they have to sort of pre-allocate the space um, here because the rows are stored together. Make sense? Column master flips this the other way around. So because what happens is, imagine I'm doing a query that says I'm doing like some sort of a column aggregation. Let's say I'm, I'm looking for average of column one. So I'll go look at column one data here, another column one data here, go to the column one next one. So if you think about your data laid out on disk, there's a lot of seeks, all right? Your disk has to go and go to find this one, find this one, so there's a lot of jumping around. So uh, not great performance. all the columns together, right? So you may have multiple, you know, a single row data can be stored in multiple files. You can see, see here, right? My single row data is split up on multiple files, but each file stores all the columns together. So the beauty of this is, when I do like a column based aggregation, let's say I'm doing like an average, right? average of column one. All I have to do is just go through this file, because remember this file has all the column ones. I just go open the file and read column one end to end very, very fast because I'm not jumping around. I'm not doing random I.O. So this, this performs very, very um, efficiently for column-based aggregations. So you can sort of see the difference between like a row-based, uh, how rows are stored together, and column-based. Okay. All right, and also finally, we you know, remember we said our, whatever database we choose has to support big data. Um, so here, let's take a look at this one. This is one of my favorite uh, diagrams. So at the bottom layer, we have data size, right? starting from gigabytes all the way to petabytes. On the vertical axis, we have access time or query time. So real time. So when I say real time, I mean sort of milliseconds, right? You know, almost immediately. So right here is MySQL. Let's say I have a few gigs of data. I dump them into my MySQL, and I can query them in real time. Perfect, right? I mean, this, this is kind of how most of us did our web applications. As our data size grew, we probably went to something like Mongo for looking for a little bit more scale, right? Again, you know, it's like sort of hundreds of gigs of data. Mongo can very comfortably support, so on and so forth. And then you sort of go into terabytes territory. If you had to store terabytes of data, this is when these, you know, these big NoSQLs come into play. HPS, Cassandra, Vertica, things like that, right? And also, if you sort of keep going down the line, and then you see sort of getting the Google Spanner and so on and so forth. If you're familiar with Hadoop, Hadoop sort of sits here. What it means is Hadoop can handle petabytes of data just fine. However, it's a batch processing system. Right? So the NoSQLs we are looking at, they are actually um, around right here. Right? Hundreds of terabytes, they can they can support very easily, and it'll still give you uh, the real-time access in milliseconds. So does the diagram make sense, um, right? So it kind of gives you an idea of you know how different components like MySQL, Mongo, and Cassandra, kind of where they fit in into the ecosystem. Right? Okay. Perfect. Alright, so this is this is all, you know I just I just like this one. I just put this one in. This is like a, a this is called numbers. Every programmer should know. If you do a search for it, you know you sort of see. Kind of pretty cool to see. Um, they say, what's the most fastest operation, and then what's the most expensive operation in computing, right? So uh, pretty cool. So I'll skip this, but um, you have the slides. All right. Next, so now that we sort of have more lay of the land, we say, yep, so we sort of understand the cap theorem, no sequels, you know, and what are the trade-offs. How do we choose this, right? So before, as a web developer, when you're choosing a no sequel, first thing I will look at is cap theorem is important. Okay, now that we know, we know the implications, meaning, I have to either choose this cam or choose this cam if you're going no SQL route, right? So what it means is, do I want consistency or do I want highly availability? Again, there's no right or wrong answer here. It depends on the application, um, and you know people, people sort of you know, end up choosing depending on the application. They choose 
uh, something that guarantees either consistency, uh, consistent uh, views, or you know, or can be highly available. Again, only you can evaluate depending on your application need. Another thing I look for is language API support. For example, let's say I'm a Java programmer, and I want to make sure that whatever database I choose support Java, because I don't, I don't want to go and learn another language just to sort of use a database, right? because it, it, if it supports a language I already know, it makes things a lot easier. Another thing I look for is ecos a good ecosystem. Does it have a good community? Meaning, you know, like for example, you know, one of the good communities like uh, you know news groups or mailing lists or something like Stack Overflow. Right? When, you, when you get into issues, uh, you can get some get some help. But you know, what? that's not enough. I also look for is the database some, somewhat commercially supported? Because imagine you're doing a production system uh, using a NoSQL and something really really bad happened, and you want some help. You help, that shouldn't involve posting to a mailing list and praying somebody's going to respond to your, uh, your email, right? That, that's not how you want to run a production system. So you really want to make sure that you know, somebody out there can support your database commercially. This is very important to me, especially when you're doing production systems. Um, I, I look for something that is supported. And of course, you know, I'm a big fan of open source, so you know, I look for something as open source. And these days, is, it's pretty much all the NoSQLs uh, you look at, at least most of them, are open source. Uh, which is which is great news. You can actually go and download and start using them, um, and also and when you get get to the level you really want to go to production, then you can get a premium support. That's a perfect way to go. And also I look for familiarity. For example, let's say I know Cassandra, and my team knows Cassandra, and we think Cassandra is a good fit of our application. So you know we probably don't want to go and experiment with you know other databases because we sort of know this. We know we know we know database and we know it's going to work great. So we'll stick with that. So familiarity with the database is very important to of you and your team. So these are some of the criteria I look for when I'm choosing NoSQL because, like I said, there are so many choices. So you can only you know, pick and choose um, the one that's going to work for you. So one thing I want to quickly do, uh, highlight is now that we have some time, I want to show you guys a, a popular uh, NoSQL database, uh, Cassandra. So, so what Cassandra is? A Cassandra is a um, uh, open source database uh, built for really high scale and provides very high speed reads and writes and also offers what we call tunable consistency. Remember the consistency level we read, you know, we can be strong or eventual. Cassandra gives you something, some, you know, something you can tune. Another cool thing about Cassandra is when you um, uh, look at Cassandra, it scales really, really well. So here's a, a benchmark by Netflix. Um, so here, at the horizontal axis is the number of machines, and the vertical axis is like a writes per second, right? And you can see they sort of started with 50 nodes, and they sort of went up to about 300-ish nodes, right? And at that point, they achieved 1 million writes per second. I mean, if you think about this, 1 million writes per second, that's insane, right? That's insane amount of data. What's even more impressive is look at the, um, look at the scale, right? Just scale. It's linearly as you add nodes, just your, your throughput just goes up and up and up. Pretty cool, right? Most of the RDBMS kind of, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, their throughput kind of goes like this, right? I mean, you know, they sort of, you know, you sort of flat, they you sort of flat out. But look at Cassandra, it just keeps scaling in a straightforward line. Uh, so here's a link I, I, I gave a link for you guys, so it's, you, know, you can look at the benchmark and how they did it. But yeah, pretty pretty cool study. The way Cassandra owns this data is very similar to databases. So you can sort of see, I, I give them uh, two comparison, Cassandra here and RDBMS here. So they have like a, so here, the, it's like a cluster, right? A cluster could be, let's say I have five node Cassandra cluster, or you know, 50 node Cassandra cluster, cluster. And within a cluster, you have key space. Key space is very similar to like a database, in a database. You can have multiple key spaces, just like you can, you can have multiple databases. And within a key space, you have tables. All right, so here I'm just you know showing you a table. Um, you know, one table is for users, another table calls for movies. So very, very similar uh, to a relational database. So imagine I'm doing a you know, let's say I'm doing a Netflix application. Let's say I'm doing Netflix uh, uh, application on my own version. So you can have a cluster, I will have like a Netflix key space, and I have maybe two tables, users, movies, and maybe I'll have another another table called say ratings. Right? And with the users table, you sort of see my user, you know, I have multiple users with the attributes. 
Another thing about Cassandra you should realize, remember it's running as a cluster, right? So, so in case of Cassandra cluster, the data is spread across nodes. So here you see, like let's say row one, row two here, and row three is over here, and row four, four over here. The way Cassandra does this is it uses a simple hashing algorithm to figure out which node is going to own the data. So when a, when a new data comes in, it's hashed, right? And the, 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 let's say the result of the hash is like a number. Let's say the it's, my data hash to say you know 27, right? I'm just making this up. And let's see who who's who's in charge of token number 27. Oh yeah, node number two, right? So it's going to end up in node number two. Yeah. Again, I'm sort of giving like a very simplified view of things. When the data comes in, it's hashed, and depending on you know uh, who owns the the hashed uh, token, the data lands on the node. And this is how data is uh, distributed across the cluster. Very efficient very fast. So to model data in Cassandra, remember Cassandra is a non-relational data store, right? And it's distributed. So it's very different than a relational database. First of all, first thing people will notice is there's no like a incremental IDs. Remember, you know, in a relational database you can set up a column that, that's auto increments. When you insert data, it'll keep dishing out unique IDs, like one, two, three. In Cassandra there's no such thing. So you have to come up with a unique ID for each of your data set. No joins, obviously, right? Um, and you can only query, even the queries supported by Cassandra are kind of restrictive. You can only query by columns that are part of the key or in the index. And Cassandra kind of will push back on large table scans. For example, you know, doing like a, you know, doing like a select star or bulk update in Cassandra is not a great use case. In Cassandra, the perfect use case is what I call is needle in a haystack. What do I mean by that is, let's say I have billions of rows, I'm looking for like a few rows, right? Needle in a haystack. And this is the perfect use case for Cassandra. So if you have a use case like this, when your queries return like a few rows out of you know billions of rows, then Cassandra will, you know, will work really, really well. All right. So Cassandra has a, I think it's one of the first databases to support some sort of a SQL. So it's kind of like, a, you know, Remember, we are talking about NoSQL, right? Um, but then we are talking about SQL. In the NoSQL moment, there's a kind of a, a turnaround. Now we are sort of in, a lot of NoSQLs are coming around and supporting SQL now. Because what we realize is, there's none, nothing wrong with SQL. Right? SQL is a great little language for queries and defining schemas. The problem was database engines, right? So we don't want to throw out SQL along with the, you know, that old database engine. You know, we, we, like, we like SQL. So a lot of the NoSQLs now actually is supporting SQL. Uh, to, to a different degree, they, they may not support like the 100% SQL, um, um, you know, because you know some some of them, most of them don't support transactions, but they will support pretty bulk of SQL. The reason SQL support is here is 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 of use, right? Because you know if you're coming in a relational environment, you know SQL and you understand SQL you know, right away, rather than kind of learning some sort of a, you know obscure API. I'd rather work in SQL. And looking at SQL, you know, so, so this is SQL, right? Cassandra query language, CQL. And you can sort of see it supports all the usual um, types, your integers, your floats, your um, strings, all the usual types of support. So very much like a database. Right? So let's, let's model a quick scenario on Cassandra to give you a taste for, you know, you know what it's like to do a NoSQL model. Okay, let's you now stick with the example. Let's say we are doing, you know, Netflix. Let's call it MyFlix, right? And I have these three models. I have users, I have movies, I have ratings. So let's look at movies. Uh, actually, I'm call calling movies as features because you know I, I realized Netflix not just has movies; it also has um, um, you know like TV shows and stand-up shows. And so we, let's call them features. So these are the three attributes on a feature I want to store. Right? I want to store the name of the feature. I want to do a release date, and I want to do like a type. And for example, like a TV show or a movie. So here's some sample data you can see, right? Make sense? Yep. Um, feature name, release date, and the type. Very good. Let's look at relational first, right? Because that's we understand. So in relational, I will store the same three attributes. I'll usually create like a a fourth column. We'll usually call it ID, and then we'll make it as primary key. And I'll say, hey, you know what? This column is auto increment, right? Remember, I mean, so it's a database term, most of them support it. So what happens every time you insert a data, you get a unique ID, see, one, two, three. And this will be your primary key for the row. 
this we understand. Right? Auto generated union keys. But remember in Cassandra, Cassandra does not have this auto increment feature. So what we need to do is we need to come up with our own unique key for each row. So let's let's do this. So kind of you know again comparison. What I want to do is I don't want to you know um, I'm going to supply a unique code for each row. Again, this is this is this is me supplying, not Cassandra generated, right? So let's say I'm sort of you know doing like let's say I'm doing like doing like IMDb movie code kind of thing, right? I'm I'm coming up with some sort of a unique string to designate each row. So you can sort of see the difference. Relational database where the, my unique ID is generated automatically. In Cassandra, I have to supply the unique key. When I say I, the application, right? All right. So in Cassandra, let's see how we do this table. Very much similar to MySQL. So I'm creating a table. Here are all my attributes, right? Name, type, and release date. And here's my my code. I you know I'm adding, right? Because I want a unique key. Because names are not unique, so I need it's something unique, so I'm, I'm adding a unique code. And I make it a primary key. And take a look at the insert example. Right? I mean, this is just SQL. Pretty cool, right? I'm inserting into a table. These are the attributes, code, name, and at least date, and these are the values. I mean, this is just SQL. Nothing more, nothing less. Okay. All right. So, hopefully, uh, we have some time. Let me show you guys a quick demo on this one. Uh, in Cassandra. So I have like a, a little Cassandra cluster running right here. Um, just a sing single node cluster. I'm going to use the SQL shell. And I already have a, um, a key space grid, so I'm going to use that. What I want to do is actually I want to actually create um, the movie tape. Right. Again, same thing you see earlier. I'm just copying and pasting the same code. Right. Very good. My table is created. And then let's insert some data. So here, again, I'm just doing some insert. Just same thing you guys have seen earlier. I'm just copy pasting it. Um, very good. Good. That went well. Select star from features. Right. Let's see this. Look at that. Simple SQL. And I get a nice, pretty output. Right. I mean, this just looks like a regular database. Right? I have here's my primary key, and then you know all the attributes. Pretty nice, huh? Let's do some queries. So let's say I'm you know doing a select star from features. Let's say I'm going to query by my primary key, where code equals let's say Mad Mad. Right? Great. Yep, that works. I got the result back. Let's say if I want to um, find, um, let's say, all the TV shows. Right? So I'm going to say same the same query, right? Select star for my features where I'm going to say where type equal TV show. Right? You guys all see that? Yeah. That's my query. Pretty simple SQL. Whoa. Now Cassandra says, wait a second. This query is not supported because you are querying by a column type right here that is not part of a primary key or not indexed. Now this is a bummer, right? Because in, in a relational database, this query will work. Even if it has to go and do a, a table scan, you can pretty much query by any column. In Cassandra, this is the first limitation people notice is you cannot just query by any column. You can only query by primary key. So right here it works, right? Because I'm using primary key or indexes. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting, right? Because so immediately you sort of see the number of queries supported by Cassandra is pretty restricted. So what what can I do to make this work? What can I do to make this work is let me say, okay, you know what? I'm 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 going to sort of you know add some indexes. Okay. So let me say let me create an index on the on the type column, right? Again, pretty simple. Um, right? I just create an index right here. And then let me do the query again. I'm doing the query. I'm looking for you know TV show. Right? Oops. Uh, I make, make a mistake here. All right. Okay. So you know I I, I ran into a bug. <laughs> 
what I had was I sort of edited the table earlier and then recreated the table, and it's actually caching the old table, and it's not giving me any results. All right, sorry about that. All right. So what I'll do is, but you can see, it's not actually giving me an error. It's actually looking at the data, but it's actually got a stale data. All right. Again, I sort of hit on a bug on Cassandra. Uh, but if you look at the uh, select star, you see all my data is here. Right. It's just my indexes are not returning the data uh, you, because I, I, I dropped the data earlier. All right. Sorry about that. All right. But trust me on this one. After the indexes, you can see the query will go through and it will work. So this is okay, right? I mean, so now I can just keep creating indexes to uh, query by the columns. But in Cassandra, indexes work very, very differently than a relational database. Um, uh, the indexes in Cassandra, we say they are slower than a relational database. So we always advise people not to use indexes um, uh, as a primary query source. Let me just quickly reboot this real quick. Uh, so clear the cache. I All right. Now, next thing is, I, let's say I want to model ratings. So if, what we learned from the previous example is, we can't just query by any column. The column has to be indexed, right? And and we cannot just go and create a, a index index all the columns because that will make queries very slow. And uh, there are some other ways of dealing with that. I'm going to show you guys this in the next step. Let's look at ratings, right? Users are going to rate movies. So, you know, a user rates movies um, one to five. And we want to make sure there are no duplicates, meaning a user can only have one rating for a movie, meaning no duplicates. So how will we do this? Right. In a relational design, this is kind of how we do it, right? We'll kind of create a table like this with users and features and ratings, right? And here's our data. And we'll probably make these two guys as a primary key just to make sure there are no duplicates, meaning a user can only have one rating for the movie. And we will index the columns. Right? And here's, here's a query. I'm, I'm, I'm selecting the, the data from the user. Works well, fine. And here's another query. I'm selecting the rating and the ratings for all the movies. Works well, fine. Right? This is relational design. So look at Cassandra very quickly. We're going to do the same thing, pretty similar to in Cassandra, but I'm going to skip the indexes because Cassandra indexes uh, uh, perform in a very different way. So we're going to say, say create the same key with a different without the indexes. So take a look at this one, ratings table. I have user, feature, and rating. My primary key is now is a combination. It's not like a single attribute anymore. It's actually a combination. I'm com combining user and feature. Just like our, our database here, right? Um, we have made user and feature as the primary key is same, pretty similar in Cassandra as well. Okay. And we'll insert some data and then we can query them. Okay. So let me show you the, let me see the database back up. Give me one second. Back in. It's a little bigger so you guys can see this. All right. There you go. So, you know, here, here are my index queries, remember? Uh, that didn't, that were returning zero results earlier. Now they are returning actual data. So when I do a movie, I see the movie back. Only, only moves getting back. And this is using the indexes, right? Perfect. All right, same thing. I'm going to create a ratings table. All right, and here's my ratings table. Just copy paste. Again, I'll share the script with you guys, so there's no need to write anything down. So it's pretty simple. Three attributes, user, movie, and rating. My primary key is a combination of user and feature. Right. Let's insert some data. Right. Let's do some query. My table looks great, right? I have users, features, and ratings. 
Right, very good. Let's do some query. All right, I'm selecting the rating by user. Yep, right. I want to see all the ratings by user one. Perfect. Now I want to see all the ratings by a feature. Right. Huh. And then it comes and says, wait a second, I can't execute this query, you need to sort of do it, blah, blah, blah. So this query is being rejected. That's interesting, right? I mean, because, you know, we made user and feature, but I can only query by user, but not by feature. What's going on is, Cassandra actually allows sub, um, um, querying by the primary key, but only the first part of the primary key. As you can see, feature is sort of the second part of the primary key, and so queries by that are going to be very slow. Hmm, this is interesting, right? Because now, what do we do? Because it is efficient. But I do want to query by feature. I can maintain an index on the feature, but we know that's slow too. So that approach Cassandra recommends is, and so I'm just a screenshot of the, you know, the user, right? By user is okay, by feature is not okay. So what we are going to do in Cassandra is we create another table. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I'm calling it ratings too. Same attributes, right? But the primary key you can see instead of user and feature as before, that's what before here I'm doing feature and user first. Because why? I want to query by this attribute all the time. That's interesting, isn't it? Same, same, same data, but my primary key is flipped. So let's try this and see what happens, right? So I'm going to create another table called ratings2, same attributes, except my primary key is actually flipped. My feature is the first part of the primary key. That's the same data, the same data I'm inserting. I'm inserting the second table as well. Right. And then let's do some queries. So let's see the data. Remember, I'm querying ratings number two, right? Ratings two, all the data's here. Now ratings two, let's do where feature is equal to say F2. Cool, that works. Right now I can query by feature all the ratings for all the movie, one movie. What about user? What about I go back here and say, show me where user equal U1? No. Right? <laughs> so now you're going to sort of see a pattern, right? When you have a table defined, it's very easy and very fast to query by the first part of the primary key. So what we are doing is we are actually creating tables per query. Next, nice. so here's a screenshot from the ratings table. I can query by feature, but not by user. So this is, a, this is an interesting take from Cassandra. In Cassandra, what we do is we actually create um, tables to answer query. Because in a database, we usually say we do it have the data, we do a model, and then we do a query. We can slap on indexes. But in Cassandra, we need to know the query first. And then we model model the data, or model the model, model the schema and then data. Right? So need to know the queries beforehand before designing schemas, right? Because in Cassandra, queries are, are restricted. You can't just call them by random, you can just query by random columns. Indexes, yes, indexes are there in Cassandra, but we recommend, you know, use them sparingly. We don't, you know, don't treat them like a database index um, because they work very differently. So again, what we showed you guys is like, don't don't be, you know, don't look, look, be reluctant to create new tables. If somebody comes and say, I want to query by a new new um, attribute, usually the recommended practice is to create a table uh, with that attribute as a primary key. And also remember, you know, even though we haven't looked at it here, there's no joins, so we want to actually denormalize the data. But the most important takeaway uh, for you guys should be in Cassandra, this is important. You need to know the queries first. And then don't be afraid to create specific tables to answer um, answer specific queries. Right? So that's kind of like, you know, kind of the Cassandra way, right? Because you know, as you can see, if I want to query by user, I am querying the ratings table. But if I want to query by a feature, then I have to query for ratings two table. So two different tables, right? I have the same data, two different tables. All right, guys. So we kind of quickly went through this very quickly. So now let's see if we have any questions. Um, we have about five minutes. Let's see if we have any questions we can uh, we can answer. Yeah, 
there looks like there's some question has, oh, so that's good. Um, you see them up there? Yeah. Cool. All right, go ahead and run through them. Absolutely, yep. So a question, a couple of, uh, there are a few questions. Um, I'll answer a couple of them, and then what we'll do is we'll send you an email with the, re the rest. So uh, relational databases and clustering. Uh, why can't we have relational databases as a cluster? Uh, thing is, not all the relational databases support clustering. A few that do, but not all of them do, right? And especially in the open source world, um, even though things have improved quite a bit now, uh, in the early days, maybe five, ten years ago, there weren't a whole lot. Um, that supported clustering. Um, there's a specific question about um, uh, mark logic. I need to look this up. Um, uh, we'll come back. Okay, so what is node exactly? Good question. So when you say node, it's basically a machine. So we, we pretty much interchange node, machines, and hosts um, through the same thing. Right? Yeah, so in, in a, in a when you talk about distributed systems, you will hear people saying node or machines or host, same thing. Just think like a, 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 you know, a physical machine, a computer, right? Right, so um, coming up with a unique ID, uh, yes. So for example, um, how do we generate unique IDs? Remember, in a, in a database, Cassandra doesn't get unique IDs, we had to come up with an IDs, yes. You had to come up with a scheme to assign unique IDs, even if you're inserting like you know millions of rows, uh, you had to come up with, you know, it could be an automated scheme, but you had to come up with a scheme because you cannot rely on Cassandra to generate a unique ID for you. Oh yeah, are the slides available? Yes. So what we are going to do is um, right after this one, we are going to email you guys the slides, um, um, probably later today or maybe tomorrow. Yeah. So you will you will get the slides. Right, so uh, for example, if somebody wants a query by ratings, do we need to create another table? Um, yes, very, very much so. Again, in Cassandra, it's a very, I mean, even though from a relational point, uh, point of view, it sounds very heretic, but in Cassandra, it's very, very common. We create uh, tables to answer specific queries. Yeah, so let's say you're, you want to query by another attribute, and that query, you get that query all the time. Yeah, most likely you will end up creating another table. Okay, so what if you know I get a um, I, I design a schema for a particular query, and then uh, you know a few days later somebody comes and says, oh by the way, we need to query by this this column, and this happens all the time, right? I mean yeah, because you know, business needs change. Um, yeah, so at that point what we do is we you know we may want to create another table, and there are and you may want to sort of you know import the old table old data into the new table. Right? So. So when the query comes in, it will have all the data. Yeah. So yeah. So it's not as simple as slapping on an index. You have to kind of create a table, import some old data. But yeah, that's the way to go. So this is where we, you know, again we we really really emphasize you cannot have to know the queries um, beforehand, even though that's not you know that's not always possible. We you know we sort of emphasize to really make an effort. Duplicate data. Very good. Yeah. So question about what if I keep inserting the data over and over again? Um, in Cassandra, it does dedupe for you automatically. It will not create duplicates. For example, if you insert the same data with the same key, it will overwrite the previous data. Right? So there's no dupes and there's no errors. Right? Cassandra will happily overwrite the previous data um, uh, when you, if, you, if you reinsert the same data set. All right. All right, guys. So let's do this. We are sort of two minutes over the time, right? And I want to respect you that we will. And by 11 o'clock. What I would do is I will kind of go through these questions and we'll send you a quick email after this with slides. Does that make sense? Okay. Perfect. All right, guys. Again, thank you so much for attending the webinar. Uh, what we are going to do is uh, we, are, we are done for it now. I will send you guys a follow up email um, by end of today. Suji, thank Again, you guys, so thank much you so much. Being here and and uh, a reminder to everybody that. Um, Suji is doing a full day workshop at Forward uh, 4 coming up February 8th. It's his workshop. So go over to forward.com um, right. yeah. and check it out and look for our emails and we will get this out, um, get the recording out as soon as possible. Thank you, Suji, so much for being here and thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you, Tracy. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. All right, guys.